That's far enough. What's this all about? Just that I hate your guts. <laughs> Get up. You doped off and got one of my men killed. And when I'm bayoneted. He stood for something. It was a very strong man. But when you look back at his life, you see nothing but contradiction. It's an old argument in this country, the one about the right way of doing things, the should be's, the shoulds, you know, and it never works out that way because when you look at their own lives, they leave a lot to be desired. There's a lot of gaps in their own lives about the truth. In John Wayne's life, his service to his country, the illusion of, that he created in his life versus the truth. He was not a cowboy. He was not a Westerner. He was not somebody who liked the outdoors, even. Uh, he had, was not somebody who had planned a career other than law. And the whole legend was created, in effect, out of nothing. But once this amazing symbolic force was generated in film after film, Wayne, in effect, sacrificed to it tried to live up to it, tried to be that. How do you like the red buttonholes? Oh, yeah. <laughs> John Wayne has been dead for 18 years, but he's still voted America's favorite actor. More popular than Mel Gibson, Tom Cruise, even Clint Eastwood. It took Wayne 20 years to become a star, but he saw himself as a symbol for something larger, for America itself. It was a patriotic mission that won him the adulation of millions, but also ridicule and contempt. The Duke starred in a hundred different roles, but as John Wayne, he wanted to be remembered for only one. John Wayne was born in 1907 in Iowa, deep in America's Midwest. His autocratic mother never really loved him, giving him a name he was to hate, Marion Morrison. His father moved the family out west when he was 10 to a dirt farm in the Californian desert. They live in a place covered with rattlesnakes and he would have dreams of rattlesnakes at night. Even later in his life, he would have recurring dreams of snakes. And somehow I think that the dreams of the snakes and the poverty in which became enmeshed in his own life, I don't think you ever escape something like that. His mother favored his younger brother very much over my father. And then she named him Marion, which is very much of a feminine name. So in growing up, I think he didn't have the love or attention that he could have gotten from his mother. Then on the other hand, he had to deal with his name and people made fun of him. So I think he had an insecurity in his early years. That's where it started. His mother almost always seemed to resent him in some way. His father loved him dearly. And John Wayne was pulled back and forth. The family fights night after night. Marion Morrison never wanted to be an actor, far less a cowboy. He hated farm life and detested horses. His ambition was to be a lawyer, but this was dashed when he lost his football scholarship at university. Although a natural athlete, he just couldn't run fast enough. In 1927, the young Morrison moved to Hollywood, hungry for any work that might spring him from his poverty. He went to work in the studio, Fox Studio, as a property person didn't really get noticed until he was 22 years old, and Raoul Walsh saw this big, strong kid moving things around gracefully and easily, and quite astonishingly said he would put him in this great epic western he was about to make, an untried 22-year-old actor, just because of the way he looked. Most of us have an image of John Wayne in our minds, and it's an image from later in his career. And he looks so young and so boyish and so vulnerable. Well, what do you mean by... Oh, oh, I thought... Oh. It was this way, man. Oh. I thought you were someone else. Marion Morrison doesn't sound like a leading man's name. He's starring as a cowboy hero in The Big Trail. The director of the film had to come up with a name. Somebody had said a Revolutionary War hero, Anthony Wayne. 
that didn't sound quite right. Tony Wayne, not exactly right. John Wayne, he's got a new name. He wasn't even present at the meeting. John Wayne got a name without being there. You take Honey Girl from here on down, Dave. A little easier going. Now, Miss Ruth, you cling on to me. This movie, unfortunately, flopped. And so, after this first appearance as a cowboy, with a brand new name, which was given him by Raoul Walsh, John Wayne for Marion Morrison, uh, wearing buckskins and having his hair long, uh, he was out of work again. And nowhere to go except to use this cowboy experience in a series of B pictures. Keep going, Clara, no matter what happens. Without the B-movie genre, John Wayne has no career. In many ways, to draw a modern-day equivalent, it's television. John Wayne would make films in five or six days, three days, if necessary. It wasn't unusual to work 16 or 18 hours a day. We're all under arrest. Man, those guns. They were looking for big, strong, rugged men who would work for almost nothing, who would work in deplorable conditions, who could do what they wanted them to do. And John Wayne was a worker. Freeze up your guns, outlaw, and cinch them on tight. There'll be blood a-running in town before night. There'll be guns a-blazing and singing. Why, well, that's singing Sandy. Tonight you'll be Who? drinking your The most notorious gunman since Billy the Kid. the dead. Make it fast, Slippery. This is your last draw. But he'd make 12 movies a year. You'll never handle guns again, Morgan. You have to remember, people are growing up and they're seeing him in their movie theaters almost every month. He becomes another member of the household. Wayne was lost in the wilderness of B-movies for almost a decade. His personal life, too, was increasingly troubled. Aged 26, he'd married Josephine Sines, daughter of a wealthy Hispanic family. They had four children together, but he disliked her devout Catholicism. She would only kiss him, he complained, if a priest let her. Wayne was spending more and more time aboard the yacht of leading film director John Ford. Ford had spotted him in 1927, working at Fox Studios. Brilliant and ruthless, he was to become Wayne's greatest patron. It was Ford who rescued Wayne from the B-movie treadmill. In 1938, for a wage check of just $3,000, he gave Wayne the part of the Ringo Kid in what was to become the classic movie, Stagecoach. Hold it! Whoa, steady, ho, ho. Hey, look, it's Ringo. That yeah. was uh, an enormously powerful entrance for an actor. So Wayne's presence, though he was uh, pretty green, was uh, unmistakable. Well, it looks like you've got another passenger. I saw the film as a kid, and uh, I was just going to the movies, uh, as along with, what was it, uh, 44 million Americans every week. <laughs> and um, that one film uh, established Wayne as an actor, as a star. With Stagecoach, the world got its first look at the hero Wayne was to make all his own, dependable and taciturn, a protector of the innocent in a world full of menace. When the Indian attack occurs, Wayne, who's the prisoner inside, is freed and given a gun and climbs up on top. 
The rest are down there under his protection. Uh, so the, this combination of the free spirit and yet the guardian spirit for the community is put together in Ford Films with a, a great artistic control that he had been developing long before he knew Wayne. And Wayne was the perfect carrier. In many ways, John Ford became John Wayne's father, I think. John Ford became John Wayne's role model. And John Wayne was John Ford's best son. He loved Mexico. And he loved his, his uh, tequila. And the Duke drank, boy, he drank like a fish. Mm. And I can hold my liquor, but I couldn't uh, hold it along with the Duke. And uh, he loved to go out with this particular English actor and tie one on. And uh, they were out, I think, on a couple of weeks drunk when our country, the U.S., entered the Second World War. They couldn't get a hold of the Duke. Nobody could find him. He was drunk somewhere down in Mexico. War confronted Wayne with a momentous decision. Fight and risk his newly won fame, or stay at home making movies. So the war came along, and Wayne had served nine years of apprenticeship in these B movies. And he was just beginning to move up into the A's because of Stagecoach in 1939. And he didn't want to leave because he figured, I've waited all this time for my chance. If I go, I won't, I won't get it again. He was telling John Ford, I got one more movie to do, and then I'm going in. And he was making all these excuses in the letter. They're really kind of comic that uh, I have the letter, I have the papers to fill out, but I'm on location. I don't have a typewriter. You know, they're not going to accept John Wayne if he prints in his name. It's clear he just didn't want to go. He didn't want to give that up. Remember, most of the leading men, some of the biggest names, were gone from Hollywood during the war. Clark Gable was gone, Henry Fonda was gone, Tyrone Power was gone. John Wayne steps into a vacuum. During the war years, I think 15 John Wayne films were released during that period of time. He becomes one of the leading stars. Then John Wayne announces the actresses nominated for the Best Performance Award. Wayne would always be deeply insecure about his failure to serve. His mentor, John Ford, himself an admiral during the war, would torment him over this decision all his life. When he acted as a serviceman, as an American military hero, without a war record, that bothered him. Night and day. People assumed that he was a hero. Think of you, all you mighty men who serve the red, white, and blue. When he was touring the Pacific, he was drinking with some servicemen, and at least one of them took umbrage to the fact that he hadn't served and made some pointed remarks that ended up in a fist fight. By 1949, Wayne was Hollywood's biggest star and resumed a prolific working relationship with John Ford. He was not only at the peak of his acting powers, but fast becoming a symbol of post-war American self-confidence. Increasingly, Wayne himself believed that he had a role to play in his country's destiny. What he learned from Ford was essentially the myth of America, that America is a separate nation, it's got a special mission from God. It's not like other nations. And again, Wayne summed that up, that he was not like other people. And when he led a cavalry troop, it was not like other cavalry troops. It was almost uh, guaranteed to prevail. Wayne was a student of, of Wayne. In other words, no one studied Wayne like Wayne did. So he learned to move with that wonderful grace because he told me when he saw himself on the screen in those early films, he couldn't stand to watch himself. He said, I look clumsy and I thudded along, you know, I was heavy footed. 
and he taught himself that grace and that poise. He was an extraordinarily graceful man, physically. He was, there's a, a memorable scene in Red River where he's uh, walking to a confrontation with his son and he's pushing his way through a herd of cattle and John Ireland is trying to have a confrontation with him, a gunfight. You know that young man isn't going to use his gun, don't you? Yeah. But I haven't any such notion. Mr. Dunson. Mr. Dunson, I'll say it just one more time. Whirls and draws and fires and turns around and keeps going. It's a, an entirely fluid motion. I don't know another actor that could do that. Barishnikov, but, but he wouldn't be too plausible in the part. But it it was a dancer's skill, a dancer's grace. There was a wonderful, practiced, very practiced walk. He had it down, and uh, there was a way of squinting, a way of taking a position in a room. His body language spoke reams of dialogue without having to say it. The way he cocked his eye. He had his mannerisms down, in the same way that Cary Grant had his mannerisms down in a more sophisticated way. And I think Wayne's evoke an America of honesty, which may not be so, but evoke it, of uh, bluntness, forthrightness in the man, plain speaking, uh, the common man as opposed to the British elitist, you know, Lawrence Olivier would be the bad guy, or, and uh, John Wayne would be the good guy because he spoke plain English, you know. He would turn up his pants so that uh, his footwork showed. Uh, he had a military kind of placket front shirt with the buttons going out this way that would spread, which emphasized his shoulders. Uh, he wore dark clothes, which tended to slim him and give him a silhouette. What he was creating was an image not only of manhood or of a particular actor, but many people came to think of America. There was no sexuality, but there was honesty. You knew what you were getting. A woman would look at him. She knew what was for supper. There were no surprises. But at least he'd be straight and true to her, probably, you know? In the summer of 1955, Ford and Wayne began work on a film that showed Wayne was just as impressive in the role of a complex anti-hero. It was a film which reflected an altogether darker America. In The Searchers, Wayne plays Ethan Edwards, a former soldier who spends years pursuing a niece kidnapped by the Comanche, driven on by racial hatred and bitter obsession. We'll find him in the end, I promise you. We'll find him. In The Searchers, there is another character, the landscape of Utah's Monument Valley, a frontier wilderness which in its magnitude added to the power of the Wayne legend. I think John Wayne felt more at home here in Monument Valley than he did at his own house. He just blended in. I mean, it, you put some other actor out here, it does, he doesn't fit uh, the way Wayne did in this country. It, it's just uh, it made to order, you know, these huge monuments. He was a huge man physically and overpowering. I mean, that was a God's gift to him. And, and uh, Monument Valley was his home. I mean, he belonged here. I'm going to walk over to the spot where we, uh, where I did the scene with John Wayne and the searchers. It was when I found out that my uh, sweetheart was, we had been killed by the, uh, by the Indians, and uh, I came running in here thinking I'd seen Lucy, who was my girlfriend, and jumped in here and started pulling my boots back on because I'd run down there barefooted. I found him! 
I found Lucy. What you saw was a buck wearing Lucy's dress. I found Lucy back in the canyon. What was she? What do you want me to do, draw you a picture? Spell it out? Don't ever ask me. As long as you live, don't ever ask me more. He said, what do you want me to do, draw you a picture? You know, just like this, his eyes were like, like, like that. And uh, it was frightening, you know. But it brought my, the tears to my face. It made me cry, and that's what John Ford wanted. But Duke was responsible for that emotion in that scene. It was great. Off the screen, Wayne loved to indulge an insatiable appetite for manly pastimes, poker and marlin fishing, in an environment where women were rarely accepted. Duke was a strong, sensual, macho man. And long before women's lib ever came along, I was a strong, macho, sensual Irish woman. He didn't have to defer to me as a woman. And he said, I usually prefer the company of men, except for Maureen O'Hara. She's the greatest guy I ever knew. When Duke found out that I'd given up drinking, it was like I'd given up my manhood. It was almost like I'd been They'd taken my machoism away from me, you know, and it, and it upset him terrible. Drinking to Duke was like duck hunting and uh, uh, tennis or whatever. It was a sport. He did go, uh, you know, after the women on a pretty regular basis. I, I know that. I'm, there's no question about that whatsoever. He, he loved women. The Waynes bought a home in the conservative stronghold of Newport Beach, a wealthy suburb south of Los Angeles. Bayshore Drive was a world away from the poverty of his childhood. Now Wayne was free to enjoy a rather surprising pastime. I'm John Wayne. We're down here in Texas filming a picture called The Alamo. Now, this story tells about some rugged, self-reliant men. In 1960, Wayne set out to put on screen an epic story that would illustrate those same traditional American values that he nurtured in his own home. When I first met him, he was looking for locations for the Alamo. I saw him for years, you know, writing the script, rewriting the script, trying to cast the... Um, the movie, and uh, he had a passion about the Alamo more than any other movie he ever made. If, if the Alamo was a woman, it would have been John Wayne's lifetime love. This is a film he cared about that he wanted to make for a decade. And when he finally makes it, he produces it, he directs it, he stars in it. All occupants of the mission, we leave at once. For some reason, the Alamo became his paradigm of what true patriotism is. These people who sacrifice themselves for freedom, as he saw the storyline. And uh, he was determined to put this together and to show that he could do something that would restore discipline to America. He was beginning by that time in his public sayings to say, we've gone soft, we're not tough, we're not manly. So he was getting a kind of grandiose vision of himself as almost saving America with this movie. The picture was released in October 1960. Wayne embarked on a nationwide publicity tour, but already the reviews were catastrophic. Newsweek called the Alamo the most lavish B picture ever made. B for banal. If that wasn't bad enough, Wayne, the director, had gone over budget by five million dollars. Just everything seemed to go wrong, and it blighted his hope to be a director. Clint Eastwood and other people have moved fairly naturally from being an actor into being a director. Wayne always wanted to do that, but no one really wanted to uh, risk him after the Alamo. He somewhat lost control of his career at that point. The pain of failure was particularly sharp for Wayne. His film appeared just as Nixon and Kennedy were slugging it out in one of the closest presidential campaigns in American history. Wayne threw himself and his film into the Republican cause I think he minded 
the reviews that said the film wasn't a great film, that it wasn't a classic film. He was trying to say something about America and about what America could be and should be and maybe will be, but nobody picked up on that. Wayne's political convictions had emerged only after World War II. Having failed to fight against the Japanese, he declared war on the communists. In 1948, Wayne became president of the right-wing Motion Picture Alliance, dedicated to purging the film industry of subversives. All over the world, they pour their mouthings into the ears of the people, wearing them down their resistance by repeated hammerings of half-truths. The way John Wayne liked to work with what he felt were the radicals in the film industry is call them in and talk to them. Get them to go before you act, the House on American Activities Committee, and say what they knew about communists. Certainly this was the case with Carl Foreman, the scriptwriter of High Noon. He wanted Carl Foreman to go and to say, I was wrong. When Foreman refused to do it, John Wayne often took credit anyway in his own mind, said that he, he ran Carl Foreman out of town that he got him out of Hollywood. I think it was probably a very necessary thing at the time because uh, the radical liberals were gonna take over our business. Trouble there was that they were spouting by rote uh, uh, somebody else's way of life. And that's all right for those fellows over there. That's the way they want to live, but we don't have to have it in our country. The atmosphere itself gradually became a climate of hysteria in which people stopped thinking rationally and became totally emotional. Do you refuse to answer whether or not you are now, have ever been a member of the Communist Party? John Wayne at that point was obviously highly emotional, highly, quote, patriotic, unquote and being what Wayne was it made a tremendous impact on a lot of people, a lot. But I don't think there was any malice in the man, you know, he was not malicious. He was a totally good-natured, typical American. The Defense Department has asked me to help bring you this story of Vietnam's attempt to build itself into a nation. The leaders of the North Vietnamese military forces said that the organization, composition, and training of American forces were not fit to tackle a revolutionary war. I guess they forgot 1776. Anyway, we Americans... The war in Vietnam confirmed all Wayne's deepest anxieties about the threat of communism. His next project, The Green Berets, would be the only pro-Vietnam film to come out of Hollywood. All these people that are appearing here tonight went to Vietnam. I've been advised to say that if you didn't know it. I want you to real, um, a real American right here that did a sensational job in Vietnam, shaking hands, and he's done a great job. He's a great citizen in every category, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. John Wayne, right here. You men, I want to say thanks for showing the whole world the kind of men a free country can put up when the going gets rough. You're the best we have, and I'll ride off into the sunset with you any time. The 60s was a time of great turmoil. People's sensitiveness was heightened, and he was seen more and more as a voice of the past or of the establishment or of... Uh, or of the Vietnam War, which of course he exacerbated by making the Green Berets. All of the extras, please, who are around Mr. Jackson. The Green Berets take care of children, they give out soap, they refuse to torture the way other people were, are doing over there. So it's a presentation of the Vietnam War as entirely an exercise in humanity. It was laughed at uh, out loud by many of the, even military audiences when it was released. It made money, they all make money, but, it, but the critics made fun of it. Even some of his fans made fun of that movie. I thought of him with anger after his Green Berets. The Green Berets made him uh, uh, very much uh, out of touch to me and uh, destructive. His point of view of the war was racist 
and, and uh, simplistic, and it was ridiculous. It was highly destructive to what I saw. It was not truthful. And when I came home, you know, I started to react to him as more than just a movie, movie star, and I started to dislike him intensely. So what's this empty nonsense about Ronald Reagan being just an actor? I've watched Ronald work his entire adult life preparing for public service. His will be a new, informed, vigorously dedicated leadership. So on November the 8th, vote for Ronald Reagan. You had what Richard Nixon will tap into and will call the silent majority. To that America, John Wayne is, 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 is a hero. And so politicians are bending over backwards, particularly conservative politicians, to identify not only themselves with John Wayne, but John Wayne with them. There are certain groups of people who feel threatened. There's a sort of a thing about feeling threatened. And they feel that there's barriers to protect and borders to defend. And I think we all do as people but some people more than others, and I think that when you start to really believe the Western mythology of taking up the gun and defending your perimeter, uh, you become dangerous because that's when you start looking for enemies. Wayne now found himself increasingly out of step with the 1960s. He sank into a deep depression, and there were other shocks awaiting him. Not only possible bankruptcy from incompetent financial advice, but rapidly declining health from a much-publicized bout of cancer, which had left him with only one lung. His third marriage, too, was under strain. It started uh, going wrong because the kids started to grow up. And Duke um, was a very old-fashioned person who wanted his family with him at all times. Every one of his contracts that he signed with the studio, he would demand that the family would go with him. So when the kids got a little bit older and they had their own friends and their own, their own school, their, own, they, their hobbies or whatever, and we couldn't go with him or the kids refused to go, I was always the one that had to go and tell him, the kids don't want to go, oh my gosh, you know, they should work in 24 hours a day to make my family happy and now you guys won't go with me. Growing up, I was on the set of every movie he made, except for one, I can't remember which one. What was difficult was when I got a little older, I wanted to be with my friends. I didn't want to be in Mexico with the horses. I think that was hard as I got older, to have to go. I don't care for boats at all. I like solid ground where I can paint, you know, three, four, five hours a day if I feel like it. And it, that caused a lot of, a lot of friction. He really wanted things to kind of stay still. He didn't think that the kids were growing up. He wanted them little. So I called him my 19th century man because things have definitely changed. He was only really happy when he was working on a movie. That's when he was disciplined, focused. When he was off the set, he was kind of at odds and adrift. He was somebody whose whole life had been the proving of himself in these movies. But by the end of the 60s, Wayne no longer looked like a traditional Hollywood hero. At 62, he was both paunchy and short of breath. We went shopping and he was bald-headed, had little hair around the edges here, and his big gut hanging out. And the first thing he would do, like a goddamn homing pigeon, he'd go and buy donuts. And buy, you know, two or three uh, dozen donuts, and he'd eat them by the handful and uh, kept urging me to eat him. And people would be looking at him, and he'd look, and he'd smile, and he'd say, yeah, he's, that's right, he's an, I'm John Wayne. I'm John Wayne. But Wayne was nothing if not adaptable. Just a year after playing a rugged war hero in the Green Berets, he reinvented himself in the biggest image makeover of his entire career. Sign again? Who's Bo? He put his foot wrong. He's tired. Ah, that's no great. I've 
Fretted iron stoves up harder grades than this. <laughs> we'll camp here. Wayne was a very shrewd uh, manipulator of his image. That was a perfect career move, uh, and uh, it capitalized on what people were feeling about Wayne at that point anyway. Abby Hoffman, the radical, said, he's like a dinosaur, he'd eat me. But what a dinosaur, <laughs> what a survival from the old age of, of huge things. John Wayne, always instant box office, and the best actor candidate this year for his starring role in True Grit. Peter O'Toole in Goodbye, Mr. Chips. Dustin Hoffman in Midnight Cowboy. John Voight in Midnight Cowboy. Richard Burton in Anne of the Thousand Days. And John Wayne in True Grit. The winner is John Wayne in True Grit. I'd have known that, I'd have put that patch on 35 years earlier. <laughs> when he walked up to the stage and got it, I noticed that he was holding it by the base. You know how most people hold it by the body? He held it by the base and he had to wipe a tear from his eye. He was actually crying. Later, when I asked him, I said, Dad, why did you hold the Oscar that way? And he said, it's such an honor to me that I didn't, I just wanted everybody to see the whole Oscar. <laughs> In 1974, Wayne accepted an invitation from students to visit Harvard University, formerly a bastion of opposition to the Vietnam War. I knew that we wanted the Duke up on top where you'd drive the thing, where he could see the crowd and command the vehicle. So I didn't know how to get from inside up, up on top, and uh, so I took ten fingers. So there's a way to get up, so I, I, he said, Duke, and I, I went like this without even hesitation. He just puts his big leather <laughs> shoe on my hands and 260 pounds or whatever he weighed at the time, and I, he just climbed right up in this unconventional way to get on top. He knew exactly what had to be done to get up there. I think the police told me it was the largest crowd that, that had ever been assembled in Harvard Square. It was right next to a, a, a three-floor dormitory, and people were throwing snowballs at him. I don't know whether he, he explicitly thought, here I am back in... Uh, back in the wagon train and the Indians are trying to surround it and I'm going to get through because I'm John Wayne. How do you feel about students smoking LSD? I'm just happy that uh, you all weren't here 200 years ago. They never got that tea into the harbor. <laughs> Is it true that your toupee is real mohair? Oh, sure, that's real hair. Not mine, but real hair. That took a tremendous guts to just wing it like he did. The one thing that uh, people like him never want to expose themselves to is a situation where they're, they can only look bad, and, you know, up on stage answering unscreened questions. Uh, uh, about a few of which are bound to be hostile, and and I thought that was the mm -hmm. the thing that really uh, made the day was how how witty and funny he was, off the cuff. Sunsets at six forty two. That's five seconds. Now, pick it up, pick it up. But Wayne remained a conservative at heart, and found the liberal climate of the Jimmy Carter years deeply depressing. More and more, he sought escape aboard his converted minesweeper, the Wild Goose. Wayne's right-wing opinions were becoming increasingly extreme. He defended the taking of Indian land and attacked the civil rights movement, arguing that white Americans need not give up supremacy until blacks were better educated. He would have the TV on, and I'll never forget one time, He'd yell at the, whoever was speaking if he didn't agree with their views. And I remember one time uh, Ted Kennedy was on saying something, and I, I didn't know what was happening. But I remember he took 
something and he just threw it at the television set. He was so irate, broke the TV. We're being represented by men who are kowtowing to minorities where they can get votes. And uh, I think it's bad for, well, for our country. And I uh, am sad to see minorities make so much of themselves as a hyphenated American. I wish they'd all get to thinking that they're Americans as they should and as they have luckily been born here and couldn't be better off in any other place. Uh, they shouldn't, there shouldn't be so much whining and belly aching. I remember he started taking Spanish lessons because he said, I'm moving to Mexico. This country is falling apart. It's not what I've put my life into. It's not what I've tried to portray in my movies, the Vietnam War. And he just got, he did, he got, almost, he got depressed and he was gonna move to Mexico. He was almost yeah, like he was giving up. Now he's got eyes. Yeah, and everybody keep out of the lies here, too. Yeah. All right. You're going to lay me out for the public to gawp at at 50 cents a head, children 10. And when the curiosity peters out, you're going to stuff me in a gunny sack. But Wayne would never quit America and give up filmmaking. His last film, The Shootist, featured an aging gunfighter confronting cancer. The journalist George Plimpton had observed the Duke on the set. I had a feeling that I, I wasn't going to like him. I, uh, he stood for a lot of things that I didn't particularly, particularly uh, approve of as a, a right-wing uh, he-man. I can look at him right here, and, and you're not shooting up my nose, but if you put him around over here and I'm looking at him... I'm... He was a gentleman, and he had uh, a great deal of sympathy for people I didn't think he would have uh, stood up for, talked at length about... Uh, Montgomery Cliff, for an example, who, uh, who had a, a life pattern that was entirely the opposite of what John Wayne would expect how a person should behave. He was involved with drugs, and, uh, homosexual and all of that. And, uh, but Wayne was of the highest opinion of him as a professional. He loved professionals. He was always on the uh, set, knew all the crew by name. You could hear his voice all over the set having fun with somebody. If you listened to him talk, you did not at all guess that he was this figure that uh, was sort of the pride of the ultra-right. Uh, not that at all. Wayne boasted that he'd licked the big C in the 1960s. But in 1978, it returned with a vengeance. And this time, the cancer would win. There were times that I'd be with him and I'd look at his handkerchief and he'd blow his nose and the last year or so there'd be blood all over the handkerchief and uh, he knew he had some serious intestinal problems. Didn't want to talk about it. Uh, didn't want to alarm his family or he just wanted to carry on and above all he didn't want to die in bed. By some terrible irony, Wayne's cancer may well have come from two of the things he loved best, the American military and making films. In this case, a historical epic shot just 90 miles from the Nevada testing sites. When The Conqueror was shot in 1954, the nuclear test had already been going on since 1951, so there was considerable radiation in the environment already. But 1954 was really a banner year for testing, and the clouds came right over Snow Canyon and just plastered the entire crew and the cast. They were never out of range of radiation the entire time the film was being shot. St. George, like many other desert communities in the southwest, doesn't have a lot of foliage, trees, brush to hold down the dirt and the sand. It is desert. And what happens in the desert is that dust storms come up. 
So what that means is that all the particulate matter of all these isotopes from nuclear testing would be in that sand as it blew over the entire of the southwest. So everybody had the chance of becoming contaminated just by breathing. There were many people in the cast that died, um, maybe about three quarters by now have died from the radiation uh, at that time. By the 70s, the solid tumor cancers started to show up, which is in keeping with John Wayne's cancer, which was a solid tumor in his stomach. I knew for quite a while. He came and told me. And, but he, being Duke, you know, he was very brave. He says, um, I'm gonna beat it, because the first time, you know, he did. I knew it bothered him because I got cancer. And I was in St. John's Hospital waiting for my surgery, and the phone rang, and it was Duke. And Duke and I, we chatted and talked and everything, and then Duke started to cry. And he said, Maureen, why you? Why me? Wayne was too sick to undergo chemotherapy, but nothing would stop him making one last public appearance. The 1979 Oscars, where he had been invited to present the award for Best Picture. He had his stomach removed because they found cancer, and he just wanted to get up there so much. And so what he did was he, he got a wetsuit to put on over him, so at least he looked like he had something on his bones. I, it was awful, but his face still showed. And then I was watching him, and I knew how weak he was, and with the wetsuit, how warm he must have been. And he was standing there, and I kept thinking, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. He's not going to make it. He's going to pass out. And, it, you know, he made it, and I knew it was difficult for him. He stood up there, and, and he said, I'm going to be here, you know, many, many more years after. And, and I think that he knew he was dying, but I think he meant in spirit. And now it is time for his fans and supporters in the Congress to give him the Congressional Oscar. Several of John Wayne's friends and colleagues came to Washington to tell Congress why the ailing actor should receive the National Gold Medal. On the way up on the plane, I was thinking, what can you put on a medal for John Wayne? John Wayne cowboy, John Wayne actor, John Wayne football player, what do you put on it? To the people of the world, John Wayne is not just an actor and a very fine actor. John Wayne is the United States of America. He is what they believe it to be. He is what they hope it will be. And I feel that the medal should say just one thing, John Wayne, American. John Wayne died three weeks later on June the 11th, 1979. I really wish he would have passed away a lot sooner than he did. He really, he was under morphine for many, many months. I mean, he was not there. I really pray that he would just pass away and You know, his cult is unlike all others. Most of those cults are for rebellious figures, youth-doomed figures like James Dean or Marlon Brando, Montgomery Clift. Wayne is a symbol of sober, industrious responsibility, which is normally dull or irrelevant or dim. And he makes it vivid and personal and dramatic. Nobody else seems to be able to do that, to take uh, conservative values and make them sexy and exciting, and where do you find somebody who can represent all of that? Mm -hmm.